us, Lord, we shout your praise. Lord, in the honor and power be to your name. In your name.
Take a look at it, uh, Operation Christmas Child. And last but not least, we have a new ministry operation or new ministry opportunity coming up um, to really support and encourage the. Uh, I guess we're still calling it homebound. We're looking for a name too, I believe. But um, the homebound members of the church, we're just we're looking for people to volunteer, to put in time, to go visit, to do uh, various various things, just to show love. Um, if you're interested, you can talk, contact Kathleen Turno. Carrie Forrest or Karen Hamlet, who are right here and here raising their hands and waving right now. Oh, that, that, Kathy's here too. Hi, good morning. Um, and so just contact one of them if you're interested. Um, I'm sure it would be a great blessing if, from, to everybody involved. Um, and so with that, I think it is time to dismiss children to classrooms and everybody say hi. But love hearing you visit together. Uh, we do have uh, really some, some great opportunities in uh, finishing the year uh, 2022. We're claiming 2022 to, to, to be our year. And we have opportunities to finish that strong, strong in being about those things which matters most. And um, so I think of the trunk and treat as a great opportunity. I think what's coming up with Op Operation Christmas Child and the ability to make box or boxes here and send those as a way of creating God's space uh, in other countries in uh, uh, some very difficult situations in those other countries and the opportunity for, for uh, children and families to experience Christ and uh, to also hear and want to listen uh, in regard to our Lord Jesus Christ. So great opportunities that are, that are coming up for us. And uh, then today, just uh, wanting to mention, we don't have it in our worship folder, we have the last couple of weeks, but today after the second service, uh, we're going to have a time of just uh, celebration and blessing and uh, really committing Jose Coronado to the Lord as he heads out on his, uh, on his tour of duty uh, with the Navy. And so we want to lift him up in prayer and we want to... Uh, bless him and send him out in God's presence and committed to the Lord as he heads out. So uh, maybe you weren't even aware of planning on it. You, please, please come and be a part and just uh, just in supporting him and supporting Jessica and the children and the entire family that are uh, a, a, a part of our church family here. So that's after the that's after our second service. We'll be having that that potluck time. Let's pray. Lord, we do rejoice in you. We exalt you. We give you praise. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you for the great future that you have for us. Uh, we lift up our, our village missionaries that are in our worship folder uh, and, and that are there in Canada. And as if they've been at their church uh, in that field for uh, a number of years now, and there's a change in generational leadership that's taking place. And Lord, we pray that you would um, just work in a, in a way of, of uh, the, the discipleship and the growth of those new people that the Lord is bringing, and that you would give them unity uh, in their leadership and in their transitions, and that you would, your blessing would be upon all that they do in, in uh, reaching out and being your people there in that community. And now, Lord, as we look to your word, uh, we, we ask that you would um, speak to us this morning in a powerful way in recognizing who we are, who we truly are in you and the incredible privilege that we have and opportunities that we have in you. We pray this in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, we're still there. We'll be moving on soon. Acts chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. The Bible is full of contrasts, light and dark, good and evil, uh, uh, life and death, truth and lies, uh, reality and deception, the godly and the wicked, the wise and the foolish, those who are awake, those who are asleep, the weak, uh, the weeds, all kinds of contrasts, the sons uh, and daughters of light, the sons and daughters of darkness, uh, the, the, the people of God, the nations, 
those who are victors and conquerors and champions, yea, and the defeated. And I'm sure there are many other contrasts that are there in the scriptures that we could pick out and we can note of what's going on with the world, in the world, as opposed to other schemes of what's going on in the world. And there is one people group in the world that is different from all the others. And today we're going to take a look at another contrast that is part of what we could call the tale of two temples. Now in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, we read about uh, King Solomon's after his prayer to dedicate the temple as this place that's built to be the, the, the Lord's house or his dwelling place uh, where he lives, his home. This happens as the presence of the Lord fills the temple. And when Solomon finished praying, then fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of Yahweh filled the house. And the priests were not able to go into the house of Yahweh, for the glory of Yahweh had filled the house. Then all the Israelites saw the fire come down and the glory of Yahweh upon the house. They knelt down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his loyal love is everlasting. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering, and then this glory of the Lord, this fire, fills the house. The presence of the Lord fills the house. Now use your imaginations here, just for a minute. It says that they knelt down with their faces to the ground. And that has kind of a slow, peaceful process to it, the sound, doesn't it? This can also be translated, they fell to the ground with their faces on the ground. And I think if that were to happen today, I, I, I think that's what we would be doing. That we would fall to the ground. And you have to wonder if they didn't also. Uh, we might also wonder, or we might also have to check our bowels. <laughs> My father was a heavy equipment operator for CAL FIRE back in the day before it was CAL FIRE. He was up in Northern California uh, fighting a fire, driving the dozer, and he was trapped by the fire, and he had to come down what was almost a completely straight down face of a mountain. Uh, I've been there many times. And oftentimes as we would pass by or we would see that place, he would kind of remember that. And he would say, yeah, I had to check my shorts afterwards because they were so scary. And I have to wonder if it wasn't a little bit like that for the folks here as this is being talked about. As fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. And what we see in the Old Testament, and in fact, if you take out your notes, this, this, is, this is in there, is that fire is used by God many times and in many different ways as a way of depicting or showing His presence, that His presence is there. Uh, here's a rendering of the, the, the glory of God's presence over the tabernacle. And in fact, there are two other times in Scripture that we have this kind of description of God coming down and accepting the sacrifice as He consumes it with fire. When the Israelites came out of Egypt and the Israelites were going to meet the Lord at Exodus 19, it says that the Lord's presence came down with fire and smoke upon that mountain. And uh, the Lord was with the Israelites in the wilderness. He has a pillar of a cloud by day and fire by night. This, this here is a depiction of that, the Lord being with them. Fire is used to depict the throne room of God, the very presence of God in his throne room and what that's like. And in fact, in some passages, God himself is described as a consuming fire. And, and what we see here is that the people recognize that God accepts their sacrifice. And that his presence arrives, and so they worship him, and they give him thanks that the Lord's presence has come to be with them. 
Now what we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, is an important parallel with the way that God's presence arrived in the Old Testament. And so we read, just going back and thinking of this. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. This violent rushing wind comes, flames of, of fire, these indicate, what they're indicating is the arrival of the presence of the Lord. That this place where they are and that they are becoming the throne room of God. That the throne room of God has now come to them. And the disciples are now individually and corporately the throne room of God. That's what's being signified. Yahweh is present with them. Now, if we know anything about the Lord and anything about the story, this is absolutely incredible. And there is a connection that we are to make. You can write this in your notes. It's about a third of the way down the page. This is the forming of the new temple of God. That's what's being indicated here. And what we see and understand is that a temple of a God was a home. It was a dwelling place of that God where that God lived and manifested its presence. And for the Israelites, Yahweh's temple was the place where the Lord of the heavens and the earth came to dwell and make his presence known. And even as Solomon acknowledged and realized that no temple could contain him, Solomon says at this time where, the, where uh, just before uh, that happens, where the Lord's presence comes, he says, but will God indeed dwell with humankind upon the earth? Look. The heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain you. Surely then this house that I have built will not contain you. The universe cannot contain the Lord. He's the maker of the universe. He's the maker of the heavens and the earth. And yet, that is what God does. He created the heavens and the earth in order to dwell with humanity. And that's what God does. He comes to a certain place, the temple to make his home and to live and to dwell with humanity. And uh, you can write this in your notes. This is important in understanding what's going on in, in all, of, all of scriptures. This is what the story of reality is about. It is a story of presence, God's presence, God dwelling with humanity on the earth. And that's what the temple was. It was a place where God could dwell and be present with his people. Now as we just think back, that's what the mountain of God and that's what the Garden of Eden was in the very beginning. It was a cosmic temple, as it were, a place where God manifested his presence with humanity. And they were to take his presence and take his glory and to expand that and spread that throughout the earth as the image bearers of God. Now, when the Lord sought to return to the earth through creating Israel to be his people of his presence, when they first came to that mountain, again to Mount Sinai, that was again to be a cosmic temple, a, a place where he would meet with his people. That's why fire and smoke was there. And because of Israel's fear and their refusal to go up to the mountain with the Lord, that didn't happen. And the result of that is that God then had them build the tabernacle. The tent of meeting. We could say this is a mobile temple of sorts. That's what it was. Where the Lord could dwell in their presence and be with them in the midst of them. Like we saw depicted in that picture. And the temple was the place of God's presence on the earth. For they were to worship him. Where his blessing was to come to the earth. His good order to creation. His flourishing that was to come to the earth through his people. Now, after Jesus' death and his resurrection and ascension and his sending the Holy Spirit, the New Testament presents each individual follower of Christ, each local church, and the church universal as God's temple where he dwells on the earth with his creation. For example, Peter uses this metaphor to speak about our relationship with Christ. 
Him being the cornerstone. Him being the foundation of the spiritual house that God is building in Jesus Christ. Peter writes, coming to him, that is Jesus, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and valuable to God. You yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, Peter characterizes us as living building blocks of a house, of a temple, a dwelling place for the living God. Paul writes this about us. For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will live in them and walk about among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. You can write this in your notes, and in fact, we want to personalize this. I put this in there in a way that you can personalize it. It's about halfway down the page. I am, you can write it in there, I am, personalized, the temple of the living God. And maybe you want to circle that, because this, this is a really big deal. Now, when Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit, when he began to advance his kingdom on the earth through his death and resurrection, and then what he does with the Spirit, he did that in a way that pictured, and then Luke writes about it in a way that pictured the presence of the Lord coming to his earthly cosmic temple and inhabiting us, filling us, filling his new temple. And what we see taking place in Acts chapters 3 through 5 is a tale of two temples. And when Jesus came to Jerusalem at his triumphal entry the week before his crucifixion, he wept over Jerusalem. And then he went in and he cleared the temple and turned over the tables and the money changers and he stopped what was taking place in the temple. And this was symbolic. This was a sign of God's coming judgment on that old temple and what the Israelites had done with it. It was a sign that Jesus acted out of the end of this temple. And at one point, uh, Jesus' disciples are admiring this great, beautiful temple that had been made, this temple complex that Herod built. Disciples are admiring it. Jesus didn't. Instead, he talked about its coming end in judgment. We read in Luke. As some were talking about the temple complex, how it was adorned uh, with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, These things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left on another that will not be thrown down. Now, that statement of Jesus that he makes here, that was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, obliterated, pulverized. And what we see taking place in Acts chapter 3 through 5 is again that the temple, this place of Yahweh's presence and worship in the midst of the, we could call the old, defunct temple, there is a new temple being birthed. And in fact, you can write that in your notes, two-thirds down the page. The theme of Acts, Acts 3-5, through five, in the midst of the old defunct temple, there is a new temple birthed. And that's the big idea, what's taking place in these chapters. That's what these chapters are about, what they're depicting. In the midst of Israel, and in the midst of Israel's temple, there's a new temple birthed, a new place of the Lord's presence is being birthed. And in these chapters, the temple and the name are mentioned again and again. The temple and the name are a theme in these chapters. And when you read these chapters, you're going to see that, that it talks about the temple again and again, and the name again and again. Now, we've talked about that in the Old Testament, the name was a way of speaking of the very presence and being of God, being with Israel. That's what the name meant. The presence and being of God being within Rome. And in the Old Testament, it says that the name filled the temple, the presence and being of God. But now in Acts 3 through 5, where Jesus has ascended and he is enthroned next to the Father, the name is repeatedly spoken of as the name 
of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ killed and risen again. And this is connected with the name in the Old Testament that indwelt the temple. In fact, I have a place in your notes where you can write this in. The name which indwelt Yahweh's temple and the name of Jesus Christ are one and the same. That's what's being depicted in these chapters. Jesus Christ is the name of the Lord, the very presence and being of the Lord who is in and with God's people by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the name who has filled God's people in order for them to be God's new temple, the place of God's presence on the earth. There's a contrast here in the story. In fact, you can write it at the, at the bottom of your notes. There's a contrast here in the story. The big, magnificent temple complex, all, all of its gold, there's gold all over it, there's adornments over it, is void, is void of the Lord's presence. You see, once it was built, the Lord never returned to inhabit and dwell and bless the people. There was no wind, there was no cloud, there was no fire, there was no glory of his presence. That never came. The temple is void of the presence of God. Even though the people went around and went about their various forms and activities and sacrifices of worship, the Jews built the temple. King Herod made it massive and beautiful. But the Lord never returned. Not there. Until Jesus came to indwell the temple. And now Israel has rejected Jesus. You can turn over your notes. And uh, we, can, we can write in there. Now in the midst of this marvelous edifice, there is a new temple birthed. It is God's spirit dwelling in the human heart and body in Jesus' church. This is the new dwelling place of God. And we see that Jesus is God's cornerstone. Jesus, is, and you can write this again in your notes, Jesus is the cornerstone of what, upon which God is building his new dwelling upon the earth. And the cornerstone brings two different directions that humanity can go, two different effects, two different results that can happen with humanity, two different ways to walk, we could say, two different ends, depending on how someone responds to this cornerstone, the cornerstone of God's new temple. We learn this from Peter's response to Israel's most powerful rulers after his arrest and he's standing trial. Peter says this to Israel's rulers, and in fact all of Israel, in chapter 4, verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Now here's the picture of what this is saying. They used to build their buildings with stone. That's what they did. They used stone to build their buildings. They're talking about a stone, which is the, the, the main stone that you put into an important place in the foundation where two, two walls join. It's a stone that has to be able to bear weight, and it also has, has to uh, fit things together. So you're careful in the stone that you choose that you get. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. It has to be the right stone, again, to support the weight and to bring the angles together. And if the stone isn't right in the evaluation of the builders, you would simply take that stone and you would throw it aside and you would look for another one. This literally describes how the builders, what they, what they were doing, and how somebody on the side as they're building might reject a certain stone as unsuitable for their purpose. And then maybe somebody else would come along and realize and say, hey, that top stone is actually perfect. Exactly what they need. So Peter quotes the Old Testament. This is Psalm 118, 22, that says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And Peter is saying to those rulers, hey guys, you are fulfilling this prophecy right now. You are the builders who have rejected this stone. You've rejected Jesus as the Christ, and yet Jesus is the very presence of God with us and in us. And God the 
Father has come along by the power of Jesus' death and by the power of Jesus' resurrection and, and said that this cornerstone, Jesus is the cornerstone of this new temple. And Peter is saying to these powerful men in Israel, hey, you guys, you have been and you are fulfilling this prophecy right now and you're rejecting Jesus. You killed Jesus. You rejected him. But God has raised him from the dead. And in Jesus' resurrection, he has been enthroned next to the Father. And God's message to you through Jesus' resurrection and his ascension is that Jesus is the cornerstone. In Psalm 118, it, it's about the Messiah. It's about this victorious king that the nations come, come against, and yet the Lord's strength and the Lord's power is with them, and he does valiantly, and he is victorious. And this psalm is also a psalm of praise and thanksgiving for the Lord's goodness and his loyal love that he has brought this victory. And in that psalm, you have this one little section that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Remember that song? That's what the song is about. It's about Jesus and Jesus being the cornerstone. The psalmist says this is what God's done. It's marvelous. It's incredible. The cornerstone that the builders rejected is God's salvation is God's deliverance, is God's goodness, is God's loyal love forever. And Peter picks up this, and he says to these big shots, these power mongers, these manipulators that, that think that they're the big cheese in Israel, hey, you guys are those builders that really messed it up. That you've rejected the cornerstone. And that's what's going on right now, guys. You are the guys that are going to miss God's great victory and salvation. And Peter doesn't seem to care that, that in the world's terms, they're the guys that hold all the cards. Because he knows in reality that they don't. That the true end of the story, they're not holding the cards at all. They are doomed. And you see, Peter has much greater eyes to see with clarity the reality of what's taking place. And this is a little bit like the story of the guy who's sitting on his roof and at his house and there's a flood that's taking place and he's wanting and needing to be rescued and some folks come by in a raft and they say, hey, hop on the raft. He says, oh no. I, I, I'm praying for God to save me. Some other folks, they come by in a boat and they say, hey, hop in. We'll, we'll take you to safety. And he says, oh, no, I'm, I'm waiting for God to save me. Pretty soon a helicopter comes by. <laughs> hey, we're dropping a ladder. Rope ladder, just grab it. Come on, hey. Oh, no, God's going to rescue me. Well, later on when he's treading water and the water's come up above the roof and it's now a rushing torrent, he cries out to God, why didn't you save me? The Lord says, what do you mean? I sent you a raft, a boat, a helicopter. You didn't want them. But here God is sending his own son, the promised Christ, and they didn't want him. They rejected him. They chose, they embraced their own agenda. And Peter is implying, hey guys, this isn't good. Because judgment is coming. And I have to think that by the Spirit of God, and then also just Peter's past experience, one of Jesus' stories is coming to Peter's mind. It's recorded with Jesus speaking to the exact same people that Peter is speaking to now. And Jesus also quotes Psalm 118, verse 22. This again is after Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem the week before his death. The folks in Galilee are also approaching Jerusalem, and they're rejoicing. They're proclaiming, Jesus is the Christ. Hosanna. Save us. The coming king. And when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, he begins to weep. 
he begins to cry because he knows that what God intends for the city is peace, is wholeness, is well-being, is restoration. But they're not going to receive that because they are going to reject him. Then Luke, again, tells us that Jesus goes in and he drives the merchants out of the temple and basically says to everyone, you're not using God's temple in the way that he intended. And it says that as Jesus is in the temple teaching, the chief priest and the scribes and the leading men of the city, they're looking for a way to kill him, to destroy him. And they begin to challenge Jesus' authority. So Jesus tells them a story about a vineyard. Now, in the prophets, the parables, the stories about a vineyard are about God's blessing and goodness and flourishing he intends to bring to creation through his people. And the vineyard also represents Israel, God's means of restoring his blessing to the world. Now, let's read and let's notice what they do to the sun. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard leased it to the tenant farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a slave to the farmer so they might give him some fruit from the vineyard. But the farmers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. <clears throat> he sent yet another slave, but they beat that one too, treating him shamefully and then sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, but they wounded this one too and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, oh, this is the heir. Let's kill him so the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those farmers and give the vineyard to others. But when they heard this, they said, no, never. But he, that is Jesus, looked at them and said, then what is the meaning of this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this has become the cornerstone. That's a pretty important question, isn't it? What is the meaning of this scripture? Well, Jesus doesn't leave any doubt to it. He gives them the meaning. He's already told them the meaning, but now he restates it again. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And if it falls on anyone, it will grind him to powder. <laughs> and, and this is a picture, again, with goes along with the picture of the destruction of Israel. If, and if you stumble over the stone, if you look at this stone and throw it out, if you reject it as nothing too important or significant, you are doomed. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and if it falls on anyone, it will grind him to powder. Then the scribes and the chief priests looked for a way to get their hands on him that very hour because they knew he had told this parable against them. Would you say that those guys are foolish? Now, Peter is speaking to the same people that Jesus did. And Peter uses the same verse that Jesus did. Psalm 118.22. And Israel's power structure in the old temple is going to be judged and come to an end if they don't repent. Which history tells us that they didn't repent and the old temple came to an end. And we see something about Jesus as the cornerstone. There are two different directions, two different effects, two different results that can happen in people's lives that depends on how they respond to Jesus as the cornerstone of God's new temple that he is building. One is what Peter says here, verses 11 and 12, and you can write that in your notes, salvation. We'll read it again. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, that has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. There's no other way to become light and be set free from darkness. 
There's no other way to become truly good and set free from evil. There's no other way to be made alive and raised from the dead. There's no other way to live in the truth and be set free from and overcome the lies. There's no other way to live in reality instead of deception. There's no other way to become godly instead of wicked, to become wise instead of foolish, to be awake instead of being asleep, or to be sons and daughters of the light rather than sons and daughters of darkness, or to become the people of God as opposed to the nations, to become the victors and champions and overcomers and conquerors. There is only one cornerstone, and again, as Peter says, there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must. Be saved. Amen. And the call of Jesus and the call of the scriptures and the call of the Holy Spirit is to repent and to change your thinking and change the direction of your life and your way of life and what you do and turn to Jesus with your heart and your allegiance and your loyalty as the coming king. And the result is salvation. Everything we just talked about and more. Salvation, when Jesus returns to judge this earth, this world, put it right, and rule it. Which is the most wondrous thing that could ever happen in this world. Amen? Amen. 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 And that's the result of Jesus being the cornerstone. But there's also another direction, another result coming to those who reject God's story. Reject Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus has said what it would be. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. They stumble over. If it falls on anyone, it would grind them to powder. Now that's a pretty graphic metaphor, isn't it? That's pretty graphic. There are only two options for your life, for your future, for your eternity of how it ends up. And Peter refers again to Psalm 118.22. You think this might be an important scripture? In his first letter, and he uses, he quotes some other verses about the cornerstone of God's new temple. In fact, here I have, it's hard to tell, but you can see some different sizes in the, in the, the font there. The bold is what he's quoting from the Old Testament, and then in between it's his words. And he says, look, this is, he's quoting, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So Peter says, so honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, and here he quotes this again, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And then another quote, a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobeyed the message. They were destined for this. Now when Peter says that the unbelieving are destined for this, it's not in the sense that this is determined ahead of time that they're going to reject Jesus. They are destined for this because again and again they have rejected the Lord and his presence and his commands and his salvation. There's destined for, for this with the cornerstone because that's what they've been doing all along. Just as Jesus says in his parable. They have been unfaithful of unfaithful vineyard and unfaithful tenant farmers all along. And Peter says to those who repent and turn to Jesus as the Christ, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. That is the identity of God's new temple. That is our identity that we're reading about there as God's new temple. And let's just think about this because there are some amazing implications if we begin to think of ourselves in this new way. You see, this is who we are. How does it feel to be God's new dwelling place on the earth? How does it feel to be God's throne room? Your very person and your very being. According to the scriptures, that's who you, that's who we are in Christ. That's pretty cool. 
That makes you very important. Amen? That makes your life significant. And that is who you truly are. It just hasn't been fully revealed yet. But you are that in the first fruits. How often do you think of yourself as God's new temple? That you actually are the temple of God's presence here on the earth. I mean, that's mind-blowing, isn't it? It's mind-blowing. But that is exactly the message the Bible is telling us. Read it. Look at it. Examine it. Think about it. I I've been thinking about this lately, and I've realized I don't think of myself that way often enough. Like, it would be really wise and good to think about that all the time. And when you think about your heart and your life being the house, the dwelling place, the place that God dwells, it changes how you live. Amen? Amen? And it's not that Jesus is out there somewhere, that he's out there somewhere when we pray, or that he's out there when we think our thoughts or do all the, our activities or go to work or our different engagements or entertainments and interests and joys and pleasures. He is with us, and not only with us, but in us. We are his throne room. And our purpose as his temple is to worship him and bring him praise and to experience his presence in loyal love and goodness and proclaim his excellencies. Did you get that? To experience his presence, loyal love, goodness, excellencies. Question. As you just reflect on that, how are you using God's new temple? To honor and bring him praise? To declare his excellencies? To worship him? Uh, you can do that by living justly, loving mercy, abiding in him, loving one another, loving others, obeying his word, bearing fruit in faithfulness, walking by the fruit of the Spirit, are you using God's temple to enjoy his presence? You see, God has a purpose in making you his new temple. That means he wants you again to experience his loyal love. His goodness, his victory, his power, his kindness, his reassurance that comes from his presence in your heart. And God wants you to know his power to free you from oppression and the lies of the enemy. God wants you to know his salvation from the enemy. And that's how God intends for us to think about and process life as we're living it. As we get up and start our days. As we walk through our days. As we end our days. God's throne room. And God has good reasons. Good reasons. That he's made his temple. Now that's a good word, isn't it? Amen. Now, for these rulers that Peter is speaking to, for them, it's all about maintaining this illusion of control or power. They thought they were in control. They thought they were powerful. But they're, it's really an illusion because they are deceived by the enemy, and they are choosing to live in darkness. And it didn't do anything to help them when the tables turned with Rome and the temples destroyed and their power structures destroyed. And you know, it is not popular to talk about absolute truth. But people live like there is absolute truth all the time. All the time. Even when it's denied by our culture. People live like there is absolute truth all the time. Except when it comes to spiritual things. Think about what we just went through with two years of global trauma and everything that we went through. I mean, what that's about? It's about people acting as if there is absolute truth. People act as if there is absolute truth, except when it comes to spiritual things. In fact, it is not possible to live like there is no absolute truth. We make decisions like that all the time, every day. 
But when it comes to spiritual things, people should try to live that way. It's a whole different ballgame. But Jesus' death and resurrection is absolute truth. And what Jesus' death and resurrection means is absolute truth. And he is the cornerstone that was foretold in the scriptures. And our response to Jesus and other people's response to Jesus comes with two radically different options. Already talked about them. I'm not going to say it again. But when Jesus comes back, judge and put the world right and ruin. And this may sound like a broken record, but there's nothing else more important, and this bears repeating. How you respond to Jesus is the greatest and most important decision you will ever make. Eternal destiny. And how you live your life now in response to Jesus is the most important thing that you ever do. When I say you're God's new temple, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Will you talk to Jesus about that right now? When I say that you are God's new temple, may, you, you may be rejoicing. Or you may be shocked and scared or concerned. Where are you taking God's temple to? What are you doing with God's temple? Maybe there's something you need to confess. Would you do that now? Maybe there's something you want to change in light of this reality. Would you talk to Jesus about that now? Or maybe you just want to rejoice because this is such a wondrous reality that God wants you to experience the love and blessing of his presence in you. Will you just rejoice right now? Lord, we do rejoice. Lord, we thank you for telling us about the end from the beginning. We thank you for telling us about Jesus ahead of time. We thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling the, the promises and coming from outside of our world as the creator of our world to become one of us so that you could give your life for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for your resurrection from the dead as proof of your victory over the powers of evil and the dominion of darkness. That you are exalted to the highest place of power and authority and that you're coming back to judge this world, put it right, and rule it. And oh, what a glorious time that final deliverance and salvation will be. Lord, we thank you that as we have repented and turned to receive you, to give you our loyalty, that you have sealed us with your Holy Spirit, and made us individually and corporately your temple, which worships and praises you and brings you glory and proclaims your excellencies. Thank you for your intent for us to experience your loyal love and goodness and power and kindness and mercy in your presence in our lives. And we ask you to open our eyes to that, to that reality that we are your new temple in this world, wherever we are, whatever we do, and that you have great joy and purpose in that for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And right now, as we move into this next element of our worship with our tithes and offerings, may we dedicate those gifts in our hearts and our worship to you for your purposes and for your glory. Whenever they have or, or will be given, Lord, may we just think of those and recognize that and dedicate them to you for your praise and thanksgiving and worship and our trust in you. We are the people of your praise and purposes we thank you for that. We rejoice in that. In you, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
families. We're thankful for the sun and the moon, God. We're, we're thankful for the rain. We're thankful for the warmth. We're thankful for the coolness. 
God, we're thankful for all of these things. But today we heard something different. God, we are your, we're your temple. It's the spirit of the real and living God. Eternal God. Who else was in us? This more than I can know, Lord. This more than any of us can know. But God, we're thankful for that. This is the new way. And upon a cornerstone. Who is the Christ? That's where we rest. So this temple, this new temple of God, rests upon Jesus Christ. I was thinking, what will I remember? What will I take with me today when I leave here? There was so much said, so much truth in a world of deception and lies and untruth. And I thought, <laughs> easy enough, God. We'll walk out of here and take with us the fact that we are the spirit, the temple of the spirit of the real living God and that we rest upon this new and eternal cornerstone that is the Christ. So thank you for that. Thank you for this day. Let us enjoy our time together in fellowship as we celebrate one of our own. And let us just know that all that we do, God, all that we do in your name, as your people, and all the activities and everything that we hear in the bullet, that all of these things be based on the truth that they rest on the eternal cornerstone of Christ. So in Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen.